I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior
Good morning, church. It is so wonderful to be able to gather back together and get into God's Word. So let's pray and we'll get going. Father God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this glorious day you've given to us. A glorious opportunity, Father, we have to meet together as a body of one. To get into your Word and ask you, O oh Lord, to plead with you to speak to us this day. And so, Father, in order for that to take place, I ask, Lord, that you would hide me and that the meditation of my heart and the words of my lips be pleasing to you, O Lord, our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, in the book we call Exodus, there are many characters throughout this journey out of Egypt. If I were to ask you, who is the main character? Many would say Moses. But the reality is, he's the second one. You, you see, the main character, the, the true hero of this great story, is God. As a matter of fact, in every book, every book or letter found throughout this book that we call the Bible, God is always the main character. But today, I, I want our focus to be, to be on this man, Moses. You, you see, many times we look at Moses as being someone special. Yet the reality is, he was just an ordinary man. Yes, it is true, there were many things he did that we would categorize as incredible but here again it was God working through Moses not Moses himself and the only time I could find where Moses did something kind of cool on his own he did it out of anger and he was punished for it now if you want to say but, but Mike Moses was a hero. Uh, that's okay. But he is the secondary hero, not the primary. Think about it. He had to go through some major change to get there. And looking at him, looking at Moses this particular day, this morning, well, gives us another occasion, another opportunity to see a changed heart that became a changed life. Let's just take a couple of moments to run through the first part of Moses' life so you will have some understanding as to, to what I'm talking about. The first thing of importance is Moses is from the line of Levi. Now, that is what we re read here in the first part of chapter 2. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer... She got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Now, Moses' father, his name is Aram, and, and his mother, Jochebed. However, most likely that does not mean anything to you or most people at all. But let's go a little deeper, shall we? Amram and Jochebed are both from the descendants of Levi. Now, track with me. Levi's father was Jacob. And Jacob was the son of Isaac. And Isaac was the son of Abraham. Remember at the very beginning we looked at how God told Abraham that if he was faithful in following the things in which God told him, 
he would be the father of a great nation. So again, we are continuing this promise that God had made to Abraham, yet in reality, the continuation of the promise that God had made to mankind back in Genesis chapter 3. Now, while we are looking at Moses, I think it's important to point out right from the get-go that Moses was a basket case from the start. All right, I've, I found the humor there. I mean, that's how his life was spared, right? I mean, his mother placed him in a basket, covered it with tar and pitch, and placed him on the edge of the Nile River. Now, just a quick side note here. Do you see, can you recognize the faithfulness of Amram and Jacobed, Jacobed? Their trust in God was huge. Let me ask you a question. How many of you mothers would be okay with placing your three-month-old child in a basket? In a river. You see, they had a plan, and God honored their plan. They had trust in God, and God operated in the trust they gave Him. Now, do not start thinking that Moses was perfect. <laughs> he was far from that. As a matter of fact, well, Moses, Moses made a terrible mistake, a huge sin. You see, I believe his intentions were good, but his actions, well, they were not. Moses killed a man. Now, he did it in defense of his people, but the fact is he still killed a man. And then he, he tried to cover it up, <laughs> literally. Only to be discovered. And when others found out, he ran. Now, all of this is found in chapter 2. So let's fast forward just a little bit to chapter 3. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire. Yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and, and see this marvelous sight. Why the bush was not burned up? When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Then he, the Lord, said, do not come here. Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. 
Let's think about this for a moment. Here's Moses just walking along, taking care of his sheep, doing what he normally did, and suddenly there's a bush burning. And, and God's there speaking to him. Now here's the fun part. That could be you this morning. You see, just like Moses did not expect to have God sh to show up and change everything, you may have come here expecting nothing particularly significant to happen today. I hope you are wrong. Let's look at the change that was made. A change that made an exiled exiled shepherd into the leader of a whole nation. You see, there was a change that took place. And that took, change took, that took place in Moses is the same change we must have in our lives today. Change means putting our past Putting our past to use. I'm going to say that again. Change means putting our past to use. Rather than that being ruled by us. Or we being ruled by our past. You see, we all have something in common this morning. We all have a past. And some of our past are shorter than others, but we all have one. The place we allow the past to have in our lives can be crucial to how we are handling the present, and I can say in the future. Understand that Moses was in the middle of his life at this point. Think about it. He was born the son of a slave in Egypt. As a baby, he managed to escape the death sentence that Pharaoh had extended over all the Hebrew boys. In fact, he ended up being raised by Pharaoh's own daughter. <laughs> like the movie says, he was a prince of Egypt. If you were to chart his life, it would basically have three parts, each one consisting of 40 years. 40 years in Egypt, living in the palace. 40 years in Midian, as a shepherd. And 40 years leading Israel in the desert. Now, in Exodus chapter 7, we, we come to find out Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. It turns out that Moses' first 80 years were grooming him to be a leader that God would use. See, Moses had a lot of past before he really began doing much that was noteworthy. His first 80 years or so were covered in the first two chapters, basically, of the book. <laughs> Think about it. There is no reason to believe that Moses was not going to just spend his life as a family man and be a shepherd in Midian. Egypt was not in his future plans. His picture was on every post office wall there was. Not only that, but his people were still suffering, still in bondage. Then along comes John, God and says, it's time for change, Moses. You see, Moses had a decision to make. He could have let his past rule who he was. Or he could choose to use it 
for the Lord's purpose. Way too many people are letting their past rule them rather than putting it to good use. Something happened. And you use it as a reason to be less than. You use it to expect less of yourself. The fact is, it is probably a lesson to expect more from yourself. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus tells us this story. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? There is no doubt in my mind that many of us here today, if not all of us, have a past that we're, we're not proud of. Perhaps you've had hurts that you are struggling to shake off. Mistakes you wish you could do over. A loss in your family that you, you are dealing with, the pain and the loss. And you can let that hold you down, give you an excuse not to do anything. Or you can put it, you can put it in your past. You can put your past to use. And that's what God was doing with and through Moses. And I believe, I believe that is what he chooses to do with us. You see, it's important to understand it. Change happens when we submit to God's instruction, not when he conforms to us. Remember the conversation God had with Moses? Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. So now go, I am sending you. What was happening in Moses' life was about to change. But it was not God who was going to change. <laughs> it was Moses. In other words, God calls us to change, to repent. And that involves looking at what he wants and commands and then changing to what he calls us to be. You see, way too many people, way too many people in America who sit in a pew every week wants God in their life, but they do not want to change. They want Jesus, and they want the world. They want Jesus and my worldly ways. Jesus and the little gods and idols that I currently serve. Jesus and my lifestyle. No matter even if it honors him or not. Now Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect your body a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. Someone has said that the problem with a living sacrifice is that they keep crawling off the altar. <laughs> that may be true. 
But I think that the larger problem is we misspell altar. We need to get it right. A L T A R. It's a place of sacrifice. It's, it's about giving. It's about changing me, placing God ahead of myself. It is not spelled A L T E R. We are not in this to change God or His Word to fit our culture, our life that we want to live. Too many people today who call themselves Christians believe if, if you are just really a good person and you do good things, then God's going to let you into His kingdom. That's what Christians, quote unquote, believe. There are many people who call themselves Christians today that believe there are many ways to get to God. But may I remind all of us what Jesus said? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There are way too many people who call themselves Christians that tell other people, God loves you the way you are. I mean, that sounds good, doesn't it? The truth is, God does love everyone. But He loves us enough to demand we change. We repent and follow His ways. God doesn't approach us and say, well, I, I want so much for you, for, for you to love me. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become anything you want. I'll do whatever it takes to make you happy. Or you can just stay the way you are. No. God calls for us to change. That means we must look at what He says and step in line with it. He is not the one changing. Can we know, can we know if a change has taken place? The answer is yes. Because a changed heart is measurable by a changed life. If we took time to read chapters 3 and 4, we would discover that when God called Moses to do the things he desired, Moses made all kinds of excuses at first, didn't he? Oh, they will not believe me. I, I, I can't speak well. I mean, he even pleads with God to pick somebody else. I just wonder how many of us sound like Moses. God's speaking to us, I want you to leave where you're at and do something else. Time to just do what I'm telling you to do. And we fire back a list of reasons we cannot change, do what God wants. I wonder how many of us have done that to the point where God <laughs> is angry. You see, God is calling for change. And when it happens, it is because of a decision to change, a, a, a change of heart. A decision has been made. Then what? Different speech, attitude, actions. You see, Moses changed from being the excuse king to boldly going before Pharaoh's throne and demanding to let Israel go. Ten times Moses approached the stubborn king, and ten times he was not making excuses about speaking to Pharaoh. Moses had clearly changed.
don't tell me you have changed if your life is telling something different to others. Do not tell your friends you are a Christian. Not if being a Christian does not have bearing on the life you are living. Do not just talk the talk. Let your changed life speak for your changed heart. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the faith. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, purifies us from all sins, John writes. The next time you consider all that Moses did, go back to Exodus 3 and 4 and Look at what Moses was before he was the great leader he became. I know that Moses had a change of heart. It showed in what he did. You see, change is what God demands in all of us. Moses was sent to cause change. That's what a good leader does. They initiate change where it is needed sometimes they are even known as being pushy god wants things to change his people were still being treated unjustly and he had promised to them the land of canaan to abraham remember to abraham's descendants he promised this many years before god wanted circumstances to change. Now, before you get all bent out of shape that God wants you to change, think about what He wants for you. If you are an addict to something, God wants you to change. If you're selfish, God wants you to change. If you're in debt, if it is threatening your marriage, keeping you awake at night, stealing your joy, yes, God wants you to change that. If whatever it is, fill in the blank, whatever it may be that is keeping you away from the great things of God, God wants it to change. Whatever it may be. Again, just... Fill in the blank and allow God to change it. You cannot spend time in the presence of God and just go on like nothing has ever happened. Moses had some ideal of how significant it was to have a visit from God. Shoes off, head bowed, face covered. You do not act like nothing is going on when you are there with God. When God is in front of you, how would you behave? But after the bush stopped burning and after you are headed back across the desert, things are not the same either. Moses was changed. So what has happened here today? What has happened here today? Well, hopefully, we have spent some time in God's presence. Hopefully, we have had a right heart in His presence. And now, as we prepare to leave here, we are not going to leave just like we were before. It is time to decide what will you do with God's invitation to change this day. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for your love, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you, Father, for the example of Moses, 
who was a changed man. Father, I pray that we become changed people. That we understand, O oh Lord, our God, that we have just spent some time in your presence. And we cannot leave here today the same as we came. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here at the port, every Lord's Day, every time the message of God and Christ has been preached, we offer an invitation. Today, today, if you're outside of Christ, would you, would you allow Him to change you? Would you call upon Him as your Lord and Savior this day? Would, would you repent of those sins? Would you be obedient to the water of baptism to, to die, to go under the water, to be immersed, to put, be placed in that watery grave and then raised to walk a new life, a changed person? If you've already done that, but you've been struggling in your walk with Christ, would you consider today recommitting your life to Him? Repenting and coming back to Him? Today, I want to ask you to pray, and I want you to follow through with what God tells you to do. Whether it's to surrender to Him for the very first time, to, to be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins, to receive the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit, or if you've already done that, just to reconfess, to recommit. Do not, do not allow yourself to remain the same as you were prior to. God bless. Hey, everyone. It's time for communion. We're glad you're here with us today to celebrate this special uh, event. Many of you have heard this quote. He is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. This was written in a journal by Jim Elliott on October the 28th, 1949, soon after he had graduated from Wheaton College. On January the 3rd, 1956, Jim and four other missionaries landed their plane on an airstrip in Ecuador, South America. On Sunday, just a few days later, January the 8th, when they did not make radio contact by 4.30, a rescue plane was sent with a rescue party, and they found four bodies of the five missionaries. The fifth body was never, ever found. They had been speared to death in an ambush. They experienced what it means to live for Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1, 21. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot, Jim Elliot's wife, and Rachel Saint, a wife of one of the other missionaries, returned to the Aka Indians as missionaries a few years later and were successful in winning them to the Lord. The same Aka Indians who had killed their husbands only a few years before. As we come around the Lord's table today, what are you living for? Maybe a better question would be, what are you willing to die for? 
These emblems remind us of the one who was willing to die for us. May we never forget that. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we come to you at this special time in our service to remember the death of your son. We know you loved us so much that you sent your son, your one and only son, to die on the cross to take our place. And for that, Father, we are eternally grateful. As we partake of these emblems today, may we, may we remember that you loved us so much, that you were willing to let your son be a sacrifice for us. And because of that sacrifice, we pray that we will be willing to live and to die for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. The Lord's Supper was instituted in the upper room during the Passover. Jesus took bread, he broke it, he passed it among them, and he said, Take eat, for this is my body. And in the same way, he took a cup of juice that represented his shed blood, blood of the new covenant. He passed it among them after blessing it and said, Drink you all of it. On behalf of myself and the leadership here at the Westport Christian Church, we want to thank you for tuning us in. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak to you the Word of God and the love of Jesus Christ. Until we can meet again, take care. God bless. Bye-bye.
Through this song, we hope to encourage you to keep on walking with the Lord. Keep 
keep walking down that narrow road. Keep walking down.